Great. Well, let's get started. We have a lot to cover, and I know some more people will continue to enter the waiting room, but we'll uh, take care of a few logistics as we get started. So my name is Molly Mowry, and I'm the executive director of a nonprofit organization called the Community Wildfire Planning Center, CWPC. And Becca, you can go to the next slide if you can. Thanks. So CWPC is based in Littleton, Colorado, and we work across the U.S., primarily the Western U.S., to help communities plan for, adapt to, and recover from wildfires, primarily through improved land use planning and other strategies. We are really pleased to have two co-sponsors for this webinar, Fire Adapted Colorado and the American Planning Association Colorado Chapter. So I'd like to invite Rebecca Samolski to say a few words about Fire Adapted Colorado if you're not yet familiar with this organization. Thank you, Molly. Um, I'm Rebecca Samolski, the director of Fire Adapted Colorado, or FACO. We're a statewide network for wildfire resilience in Colorado that supports professionals like many of you who lead wildfire resilience in your communities and landscapes. And FACO provides a statewide peer learning network. We also serve as a collective voice advocating for better policy and program administration for wildfire preparedness and mitigation efforts in the state. And we put on the Colorado Wildland Fire Conference every year and a half. Um, the next one will be in April in Fort Collins, and I'll drop a link in the chat here in just a minute. Um, my office, though it's a statewide position, is out of the Dolores Volunteer Fire Station in the southwest corner of the state. Um, and I dabble in wildfire response a little bit in the summertime. Um, before I got into community fire preparedness work with Wildfire Adapted Partnership as a county program coordinator back in 2011, I was a local land use planner for two towns in my county down here in Southwest Colorado. And coming into wildfire mitigation, I saw the difference that codes can make for new subdivisions in my county and even on a property owner association scale. Um, I recognize codes as one of a part of the myriad of wildfire adaptation practices. And it's the part of, of those practices that sets up a community for success by starting with smarter land use patterns and vegetation management and structure design and building materials from the start. Uh, but it's still up to our communities to implement programs and projects that address all the existing homes and businesses that weren't necessarily designed with wildfire in mind and to prepare residents and to maintain those areas where the codes have been enforced. Um, so I'm really excited to have Molly here today. We have who I consider to be the utmost expert in planning for wildfire based here in Colorado with Molly Mowry and the Community Wildfire Planning Center. Um, and I really am looking forward to these examples from across Colorado of how local land use regulations are setting up communities to withstand wildfires. So thank you, Molly. Thanks so much, Becca, and thanks again to FACO for hosting today's webinar. As also noted on the slide, APA Colorado is also a co-sponsor for this webinar, and this webinar has been approved for 1.5 CMs for all eligible planners. I did look this morning on APA's website, and it's not listed yet, although I know it has been approved, so I followed up with APA Colorado. I know for those of us that belong to APA Colorado, there's been a, you may be aware, there's been a little bit of a transition with their administrator. So um, I'll check back in the next week uh, or maybe give it two weeks. And if it still doesn't appear, I will be, um, I've already followed up with them. So you, you should get CMs for this and just track it and make a note in two weeks to uh, look on your calendar and put it in. Um, we are also really grateful for generous funding support from the Argosy Foundation, whose mission is to support people and programs that make our society a better place to live. Through the Argosy Foundation's grant, CWPC was able to research and develop additional land use planning and wildfire tools and outreach resources, including this webinar. So the design is to help communities across Colorado address wildfire risk through these additional tools. Next slide. For our webinar today, we have a really exciting lineup of speakers and information. So first, we'll cover a quick primer on what is the Wildland Urban Interface, or the WUI, if you're not familiar with that term, and how are WUI regulations a critical component of communities' approach to wildfire risk. 
We're then really going to spend the most of our time diving into the three case studies from across Colorado, Colorado Springs, Uray County, and Eagle County. So a lot of today's information has been synthesized from a report that our organization, CWPC, released in September. And then following each case study, we'll have just a short panel discussion and then audience Q&A. So you may have noticed uh, all audience members have been muted, but you can submit a comment or a question anytime through the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. You'll see the chat button, you'll probably see a red little number on it, like right now there's a number one. And if you open up that panel, everyone has access to the chat. Uh, speakers may respond to your questions or comments as they're able. Otherwise, we will try and address as many questions that come up as possible at the end of the discussion. So as we get started today on the main portion of our webinar, we wanted to do several introductions for our speakers. Uh, next slide. So for anyone that signed on late, again, my name is Molly Mowry, and I'm the Executive Director of the Nonprofit Community Wildfire Planning Center. I am a certified land use planner and have focused my career on wildfire planning, mitigations, uh, mitigation and regulations. I was one of the primary authors of the report we'll be referencing today. And I also wanted to just quickly acknowledge my co-author, Julia Kalish, who assisted uh, CWPC in the research and report drafting. So we're fortunate to have three wonderful experts from each of the three communities profiled in that report with us today to share their insights and perspectives. So I'd like to invite each of the speakers to briefly introduce themselves, starting with Ashley and then Ben and Eric. Thanks, Molly. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm Ashley Whitworth. I'm the Wildfire Mitigation Program Administrator for the Colorado Springs Fire Department. I've been with the program for about 12 years, and I helped with the Waldo Canyon and Black Forest Fire. So I'm looking forward to talking about our codes here in Colorado Springs. And good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many participants um, in this, this webinar this morning. Uh, wildfire mitigation regulations and general forest health and resiliency for communities has been something I've worked on um, for my uh, eight years as a commissioner. So I've been Tisdale Uray County Commissioner and have served on um, the State Fire Commission, the State Forest Health Council, the State Emergency Fire Fund Committee, um, uh, Colorado County's Inc. Land Use and Natural Resources Steering Committee and CCAT um, Land Use and Environment Steering Committees, among other things. So we're going to talk about how Uray County came to update its wildfire mitigation regulations a few years back. Hey everyone, I'm Eric Lovgren. I'm the Community Mitigation Manager here in Eagle County, where uh, I've been largely responsible for our mitigation program since I started in 2006. Uh, we too have seen, you know, a number of fires, most notably the Lake Christine and Grizzly Fire over the last few years. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the impacts of uh, mitigation, you know, regulatory mitigation action in, in relationship to Lake Christine Fire, and then talk about some, some non-regulatory complements to that program. I also serve as board chair for Fire Adapted Colorado, full disclosure. Thanks so much, Ashley, Ben, and Eric. And I'm realizing as you're doing your introductions that I've known some of you for over a decade. So it's really nice to um, just get your expertise on today's webinar. Thanks again. We also wanted to do a quick poll to just get a snapshot of who is in our audience today. So Becca just launched that poll and we wanted to see how many of us are more engaged with land use planning, more engaged perhaps with building and construction or elected officials. We know some of your roles may very much overlap, but do your best to give us a sense of who you are today. Looks like we have a pretty good split between those of you engaged in fire mitigation and fire response and land use planning. And feel free if you do want to say who you are in the chat. I know we have a lot of folks on the webinar today, but 
If you're so inclined, you can introduce yourself and just say who you are and your organization in the chat box. I think Becca, it looks like we got about everyone in almost. So those are our results. And again, thank you all for making time on a Monday morning. All right. So as we think about wildfire prone areas, we refer to these areas as the wildland urban interface or the WUI. The WUI is traditionally defined as an area where wildlands meet or intermix with human development, which, as you can see from this map here, can be spatially represented across the country and state based on a combination of structure density and vegetation type and quantity. So this definition is really helpful for determining where the WUI is. As you can see from this more recent national spatial assessment from 2020, um, this was recently updated. You may have seen previous uh, versions of this from 2010, but we're excited to get the latest uh, numbers in for the WUI data. Next slide. It may not look from a national map like there are many WUI areas in the West, but this is a close up of Colorado, so it gives you a better idea. I also want to note sometimes I think the WUI map can be confusing when we're talking about wildfire because the orange and red do not equate to wildfire hazard or risk. So think of those areas more as where development is. And again, it's the different type of development pattern that you're seeing, whether it's an interface, which is a more um, dense environment, urban environment, or intermix, which is typically where houses are more scattered within vegetation types. Um, so these are two important factors, though, when we're talking about structure density, development patterns, and proximity to vegetation. These are two factors when we consider wildfire risk. Next slide. And what the WUI looks like can vary greatly. These are just three examples from the case study areas we'll be talking about today. But I'm sure that Eric and Ashley and Ben would tell you that throughout their communities, the WUI can also look even very different just within you know, neighborhoods or different um, uh, areas of their county or the city. And this is also based on a variety of other conditions besides just housing density and vegetation type. Next slide. So in fact, where a wildland area stops and a rural or suburban area starts really creates a spectrum of wooey conditions across these different development patterns and types of landscapes. You know, sometimes we see very urbanized areas miles away from, a, uh, from wild lands ignite from traveling embers during a wildfire. Um, we saw some of this occur with the Marshall Fire in uh, December, 2021. You know, in other cases, we may see both the edge of a rural or suburban area being most susceptible to an approaching wildfire. So in this sense, it's really helpful to think about wildfire risk in the WUI as being based on a set of conditions or factors. And we can map the WUI to know where this is, but we also have to think about what makes areas within the WUI at particularly high or low risk to wildfire hazard. Next slide. So the amount of damage and devastation will typically be determined by different factors and the extent to which these have been addressed or mitigated. So these factors in the WUI may include access. How quickly can a fire crew access an area? Similarly, how easily can public evacuate from an area? Water supply, when a fire response unit arrives on the scene, is there available water for them to use to respond to a wildfire? housing susceptibility, what type of construction materials are homes made from, landscaping, how much landscaping or fuels are there around the home, and what type of landscaping is it? Um, infrastructure, are utilities above ground or buried, and open space, wildland areas, you know, how have these been managed or treated near development? And there's a, a variety of other features. So what types of other combustible materials um, are in the area or near the home that could ignite and spread fire? So these factors are really critical to us understanding how we manage risk in the WUI. Next slide. And all of these factors can be regulated through codes or local ordinances. 
So communities have the opportunity to adopt a building code, WUI code, fire code, subdivision regulations, um, development standards within their land use and zoning code, landscaping ordinances, or other similar mechanisms that regulate where and how development occurs in wildfire prone areas. And some communities have a combination of these, so it's just not one or the other. And in fact, sometimes some of these almost overlap in terms of what they can regulate. Sounds like someone is off of mute. So thank you, Becca. Um, so in terms of regulations, to a large extent, we're going to be focused with our three case studies on residential construction today. So each um, speaker will walk through what they are regulating within their jurisdiction. But there are other uses, such as commercial, industrial, temporary uses that can be addressed through codes and ordinances. Uh, next slide. I just want to make a note that as many of these areas um, in the West are, including Colorado, are experiencing changes to our precipitation patterns, uh, longer periods of heat and drought and decreased snowpack, we expect to see more extreme fire behavior and other environmental stresses that contribute to our wildfire, the urgency of our wildfire problem. Uh, I also want to note that while regulations are not the only mechanism available, certainly there are many other ways we can address and mitigate wildfire. They really play an important role in establishing a baseline of more resilient development in the WUI. Next slide. So Colorado, as you may be aware, does not have a statewide minimum code that requires local jurisdictions to adopt any specific type of WUI regulations locally. So this leaves us a lot of flexibility at the local level for jurisdictions to adopt what works hopefully best for them. Um, this was prompted, this, this is what prompted us, I should say, to look at these examples across the state. So in other words, in, in light of not having a statewide directive, what are local communities doing and what can they do to address the wildland urban interface? So I'm going to turn it over now to our three guest speakers for their experiences with what type of wildfire regulations they have in place, how they got to be successful in their adoption process. We'll start with Ashley from Colorado Springs Fire Department, then we'll go to Ben Tisdell from Uray County and Eric Lovgren from Eagle County. Thank you. Alrighty, thank you, Molly. Um, so again, Ashley Whitworth, Colorado Springs Fire Department. And Becca, you could go to the next slide. So the city of Colorado Springs, our wildland urban interface is, runs basically from our Air Force Academy down to Cheyenne Mountain State Park. Uh, you'll see here on the map, it's all of that red area. So our WUI is 32,655 acres. It is 44 square miles. And within that, we have just over 35,000 parcels and about 20% of the population in Colorado Springs lives in our wildland urban interface. So our section, we run off a few different codes that we have. So our code requirements started in 1993 um, and went to 2012 when the Waldo Canyon fire happened. So we originally had, we worked with our planning and our zoning department. And what they had is they had a hillside overlay. And so our codes at that time were specific to our hillside overlay. And here in the picture on the right, what you can see is the red is the wildland urban interface. And then that green is the hillside overlay as well. So specific back to 1993 to 2012, we had our fuels management, which required mitigation in our safety zone, which the safety zone is the first 30 feet around the house. Um, within that, they had to have clearance of 10 feet from the structures, so they couldn't have any vegetation within 10 feet. They had to prune all of their, the dead limbs up to 10 feet, and then there could be no branches over or under the eaves or within 15 feet of the chimney. Um, they also had to have a fire protection system and that was only in place if homes, um, basically if they laid beyond 100 feet along a cul-de-sac 
and there was going to be extra response time for our firefighters to get to that house. And then there was a minimum of a, of a Class C roofing material. And then in 2003, we realized that a lot of the homes had the wood, wood shake shingle roof, and that is obviously not good for fire. So in 2003, we put a Class A roofing ordinance into effect, and that was if a homeowner had a Class A roof and they had to replace more than 25% of their roof, then they had to go to a Class A roof. And then, so in 2012, we had the Waldo Canyon fire that happened here in Colorado Springs. And we went to city council and we said that we needed to update our, code, our codes and our ordinances here in Colorado Springs. So in the beginning of 2013, we, again, this was still specific to our, um, the hillside overlay zone that you guys saw on the previous slide. And then in June of 2018, what we did is we said, we really need this be to be specific to our wildland urban interface zones. So this next set of codes we're gonna talk about, um, basically it changed, you can see here, June 3rd of 2018, and then June 4th of 2018 is when we changed it just specifically to our WUI homes. Um, so again, Class A roofing ordinance, um, the fuels management zone, we kept uh, the safety zone, so that 30 feet. Um, something that we really learned was that a lot of the homes had, you know, junipers, conifers, hazardous vegetation um, within the 10 feet of the home. And so we actually pushed that back to say uh, new homes being built in our wildland urban interface can't have any vegetation within that first 15 feet of the home. And then um, the pruning of the dead limbs is still the same. And then uh, no branches over under the eaves or within 15 feet of the chimney. And then the fire protection system was the same. And then this next slide, Becca. Um, this is a big one. So um, previously from 1993 to 2012, we did not have any home hardening features that were in our codes for new homes being built in the WUI. So uh, we added all of these home hardening features into our uh, codes. So um, homeowners now have to have ignition resistant siding. Um, they have to have ignition resistant decking. And you can see the, the pictures to the right, that top picture where it's all um, burnt is actually from the Waldo Canyon fire. That was a homeowner who had a wooden deck, as you can see, and then that's what caught on fire. So um, we learned during that fire that really the ignition resistant material for the decking um, did a lot better. It kind of melts in on itself versus where the wood, when it catches on fire, it really carries uh, and, and can potentially catch the house on fire. Um, the exterior cladding, eaves, and soffits have to be of ignition-resistant material as well. Um, any of the projections um, or overhangs that are built on houses, um, that underside has to be made of some type of ignition-resistant material. And um, that is that second picture that you guys can see down below with the arrow pointing to it. Um, so we have a lot of homes here in our wildland urban interface. Um, they like to plant vegetation right under those overhangs. And um, again, in Waldo Canyon, what we saw here is embers that landed in that vegetation. And then the, the underside of those you know, projections were actually normally back in the day made of wood. So that wood would catch on fire. And then that's ultimately what caught the house on fire and destroyed it. So um, not in code, but we also recommend for homeowners not to put any vegetation um, under those projections or overhangs. Um, the exterior doors cannot be less than one third force inch thickness, um, minimum of double pane windows. Um, all of the attic vents have to be screened with um, no larger than one eighth, eighth inch uh, mesh screening. Um, and that is basically to protect those um, larger embers from getting up into the attic and then starting the attic on fire from the inside. 
And then the base of the exterior walls, posts or columns do need to be protected with, um, we say like a wire mesh or um, some type of foam. Uh, again, that was another thing in Waldo Canyon is, um, you know, the older homes, none of that is actually really protected. And so if they can actually, you know, fill that in and protect it, then it's just one less area and Ember can get into the house and start the house on fire from the inside. And then the chimneys must have an approved spark arrestor as well. Next slide, Becca. thank you. So for enforcement and education, um, so our section is within the division of the fire marshal. And so we work closely on um, we get development plans from our uh, tech services section. And so what we do is we will actually look over all of those development plans and make sure that they are using the ignition resistant material that they're supposed to, and then that they are following the vegetation management guidelines. Um, if they're not, then we're able to make comments and send that back, and then they actually have to redo that entire development plan. Um, specific to just wooey homes getting built, uh, we do what we call a pre-framing inspection. So the homeowner or the builder will submit their plans, and we also work with our, uh, the planning and zoning for Hillside as well but they will make sure that everything is following their guidelines. And then what we do is we will actually go out on site and we will meet with that homeowner or that builder. And then we will make sure that all of their vegetation that they are either wanting to keep will actually follow the guidelines for the vegetation management. So that gives us the option to meet with them, um, mark the vegetation that we need to mark for them take pictures um, and then document that as well. Uh, so um, our section is very big on education. We always wanna educate our homeowners on, um, you know, why are we requiring them to do this? And um, we also have to enforce that. So um, I have, you know, people in my section, what we'll do is we'll go out. If we do see a home, um, you know, that is not in compliance with the vegetation management codes we have, um, what we have to do is we actually have to give them a written warning. Um, we give them 30 days to address the issue. And then we work with our code services section who has inspectors and we will pass that along to them. And then one of their inspectors can follow up and um, we've never had this happen, but if a homeowner um, say they didn't want to remove that vegetation, then they could actually get a summons to go to court. So um, more than not that educating the homeowner, letting them know why they need to remove that vegetation for fire, um, they, they're, they want to comply with, with that. So we've never had an issue. And then I kind of jumped ahead, but the construction services section here in um, the DFM2, that's where we work with them on the new, new Wooly homes that are getting built as well to make sure those plans are following the vegetation management guidelines and the ignition resistant materials. And then I just wanted to throw a few resources. We do have our website, um, our wildfire risk map, um, all of our codes and ordinances. We do have an, an ignition resistant design manual that is on our website. Um, so everything I talked about, you can find there as well. Um, and then again, just for our section, we do offer on-site consultations where we do meet with those homeowners to let them know what they need to do on their property to make sure they're in compliance and how they can reduce their wildfire risk. And then um, the cost share stipends and our free neighborhood chipping program. So we do try to offer a lot so the community can reduce their wildfire risk. But that is all that I have, Molly. Ashley, thank you. Before you go off camera, a really yeah. quick clarification that might be helpful. This came up in the chat. Paul Kata asked, what definition is Colorado Springs using for ignition resistance? So I don't know if you are comfortable answering that now or want to type in the chat a reference to um, any code language, but just thought I'd ask while you're still on. Yeah, um, I'll get it and I'll uh, throw it in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. And now 
We'll turn it over to Ben, and thanks for those of you who are putting some questions in the chat, and we'll continue to try and field those as they come up or get to them at the end of the webinar. All right, Ben, uh, it's all you. Hey, thanks, Molly. Um, hearing um, the Colorado Springs example, it's remarkable how similar Uray County's um, code is uh, our code covers quite a few of the almost all of the same elements in, in similar ways um and i'm going to talk more about the process rather than what's in the uray county code um you can see the current version of our wildfire mitigation regulations is housed in our land use code um, it covers the entire county for reasons that um we had a, a good discussion of, of what parts of Uray County are most prone to wildfire uh, risk. And after discussing between the commissioners and the planning commission, Uray County covers about 500 square miles and is ranges in elevation from 14,000 feet to about 6,000 feet. And the development are primarily clustered in the city of Uray, the town of Ridgeway, and then unincorporated county um, in an area called Log Hill. It has uh, a lot of mixed pinion juniper and is, is the location where most of the new development in the county is occurring. Um, and so we decided that there is no place in the county more than you know, or, or more than 13 miles away from, you know, a, a the most probable source of an ignition in a forest. And embers travel uh, generally, they, they've been known to travel at least 13 miles. And so we decided that everything in Uray County is wooey and that our wildfire mitigation regulations apply to the entire county. Um, that was a pretty easy discussion to have. Uh, I think statewide, it's a, it's a more difficult concept of how to define where the WUI is and where it is not. Um, but it, it, our regulations apply countywide. They apply primarily to new construction and then also to um, additions and renovations that affect more than a percentage of a residential structure. Um, the reasons why we got into updating the 1999 regulations were really just a, a very observable, um, tangible uh, climate change analysis that we could see bark beetles coming in, we could see whole patches of forest um, dying rapidly. And it started, it triggered a bunch of questions of, is this a fire danger? Is this, you know, is, is it going to be a um, property value question? what is if it all catches on fire what happens um, from our federal and state partners and their responses and our analysis was they're more likely to be able to come to the county's aid if we are doing our own bit to prevent it from becoming a larger catastrophe uh, the other reasons that uray county wanted to uh, update the 1999 regs. Uh, increasingly, Uray County has many seasonal residents. They have a house here, they have a house in Texas or California or some other state, and they are not in a position always to see or respond to uh, hazards and risks because they might be away for six months. Uh, increasingly, that development is occurring in um, in more remote parts of the county that we haven't seen development occur. And paired with that is um, a trend, I think that's a national trend, is that our volunteer fire departments have seen a downward shift and trend in, um, in volunteerism in general. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to recruit, retain, um, and attract volunteers for the fire departments. Um, next slide, please. And so our process was to really, I, I, start, I initiated a process um, by becoming familiar with the updated science and the, the Colorado Wildland Fire Conference 2015 and 2017 
um, first one was in Snowmass and then in um, Pueblo, I believe, uh, was just a, an amazing place to learn from uh, statewide experts on what is, um, what should be our concern. And a lot of people initially thought, well, it's really about defensible space. At the Snowmass conference in 2015, there was a remarkable presentation that said, D space is just part of the concern. It's really, you should really, really be thinking about what your buildings look like and how they behave when there is a fire near uh, near them. And the, the science of embers was was a very heavy emphasis. Um, Paul Cada from Vale Fire did a, an amazing presentation on that and a few other things as well. Um, and we also, as a county, participated heavily in our West Region Wildfire Council that had uh, regular meetings from, um, from fire responders as well as insurance rating um, agencies. And, and we learned how uh, insurance agencies uh, take some of the ratings from, from experts like CoreLogic and implement them. Um, so after we learned, you know, we saw reasons why we needed to update regs, what some of the science was, the Board of County Commissioners decided, yes, this is something we urgently need to deal with. Um, it is a problem in Uray County, and we charged the Planning Commission with uh, studying themselves what uh, sort of code updates should occur, and they, they took it on enthusiastically. They also, we sent the entire planning commission to the 2018 wildland fire conference in Crested Butte. And um, they spent about a year uh, following that with the, uh, with again, with the uh, West Region Wildfire Council. Uh, they, they had public meetings, uh, they took on advice from uh, the construction industry locally, from concerned homeowners, from um, from many other sources, and they had a, a good public process of creating what has become the the core of our our new Section 16 wildfire mitigation regulations. It's very similar to the International WUI Code, which is also similar to the. Um, I think there's a there's also a a recommended or kind of sample code that the Colorado Resiliency Office has has put forward, uh, but we tailored that to um, the unique concerns of Uray County. Next slide, please, Becca. Um, when it came the time for the Planning Commission to make the recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners, there there was not much of a pause, but it's always it's the board, the role of the commissioners to say, well, this is, goes too far in one direction or it doesn't go far enough. In our case in 2019, um, we had just had a wildfire uh, that was entirely in forest service lands, but if the wind had shifted, it could have gone over a ridge that had no fire break on it and been very close to the city of Uray. Uh, so there was there was a, a strong political will to go ahead and adopt what was seen as very strong uh, wildfire mitigation regulations, and we did that in December 19 with a delay of five months because it took the our planning department uh, a number of months to build up training materials and and forms and become familiar with how to implement the code itself. Uh, that adopted code was effective for about a year and a half and the findings were that the point scoring system that was part of the 2019 adopted code was cumbersome difficult to explain um, and we had some some reasons to to look to change it but the acceptance of the 2019 adopted code was was really um, widely accepted. It was um, some people thought it did not go too did not go far enough. Um, a problem with uh, unique potentially to Uray County is that the defensible space aspect of the code was difficult to implement um, in the summer months uh, when 
pinion trees are part of the space that is that needs to be treated. Uh, pinion hips beetles tend to congregate more when the, the tree is, is removed. And uh, sometimes the pieces of the trees are left in place. So we implementation of defensible space was a, a strong reason to then go back and look at how can we improve the code. And the next slide describes a little bit more about that. Um, so we we took on recommendations from the planning commission from the planning department to make some uh, changes to the 2019 code. We adopted that in March of this year, and it basically simplifies uh, the complicated elements um, into pass fail elements. So it either the structure either has a class A roof or it is not permitted. Um, the D space implementation. Uh, we found a few ways to to separate the timing. Generally, construction occurs in the summer here because of the winter months are very cold. And um, but if it's a pinion a tree aspect of of defensible space, we want to cut that down in the winter. So we found a way to issue a certificate of occupancy and still make sure that the defensible space was implemented if that was part of the solution. The other way to get away from as much D space is to have non-combustible siding completely. So there's an option in our code. Uh, that an updated code became effective in May of this year. Um, we also in Uray County have taken on other ways to address our concerns about what is happening with climate change, what is happening with um, with landscape scale treatments. And so we encourage, we work with West Region Wildfire Council to do parcel scale fuels treatments. We work with the State Forest Service and the US Forest Service to do landscape fuel treatments, including encouraging prescribed burns where safe. Um, that has not always in, been the case where a prescribed burn um, can be done and conducted safely. There is, there's always a chance that it will escape. And we did have an escaped prescribed burn in May this year um, and an extensive analysis of why that happened and what happened. It's getting more difficult to conduct safe prescribed burns because of changing weather patterns and wind conditions. Uh, paired with all of that, when a fire does happen, it's not if, but when, it's really important to get evacuation route um, analysis and modeling and simulations done properly. And we're in the process of, of doing that. Education, we have educational components of the code that are not mandated, um, but simply there for new homeowners to read through. And we continue to have strong partnerships with all of our uh, partner jurisdictions in the regional, state, and federal levels. A few takeaways from all of this are on the next slide. And um, it's important to, to continue your focus on the need that is observed. So on the first slide, we said we're, you know, we're concerned about safety of our community for these reasons. Um, We've developed a code that addresses those reasons that's based on science. Um, the code has evolved to become simpler and we think stronger. And the code itself is not the only solution. Um, our partnerships with um, other jurisdictions, as well as our participation in the, uh, the State Emergency Fire Fund Committee, the State Fire Commission, the State Forest Health Council, with the Regional Forest Service Office, um, the State Forest Service, and any partnership that we can find we'll work with. So it's a thank you for hearing about Uray County's journey. And I'll take questions uh, probably during the panel. Thank you, Ben. Eric, I see you're queued up. So we'll look forward to hearing from our third and final case study speaker on Eagle County. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Molly. And yeah, you'll hear you'll hear all these common themes um, throughout my presentation as well. Maybe addressed 
the same or, or slightly differently. So here we are, Eagle County, home to Vale and Beaver Creek and right there in, in Northern Colorado resort country. Uh, pretty close to 60,000 permanent residents. Of course, given the time of year, um, that number can swell dramatically with, with guests. Most of them coming to enjoy all this beautiful public land that is part of the White River National Forest and Colorado River Field Office, the BLM. But all of that private or public land ownership sort of puts the remaining 20% private land under um, you know pretty intense development pressure and, and, and can generally be characterized by in the valleys and, and sort of along the river corridors in, in the county. Next slide. So we've had wildfire regulations on the books for a while now. Um, you know, they were adopted in 2003 after the 2002 fire season, which of course you had things like Hayman and Coal Seam and Missionary Ridge. It was a, a big season in Colorado and, and we reacted as such. And the, the purpose of these regs were aimed heavily at, at people and property, right? We're trying to minimize the impacts of properties, provide better access by firefighters, as well as, you know, this starting to poke up this idea of how do we build fire adaptive communities that what's happening on one property can, uh, you know, impact the occupants of the neighboring property and that we might all have a shared responsibility in, in preparing the Wuwi for fire. Next slide. So we'll start with land use applications and, and you know, our, our regulations have a land use as well as a building permit um, aspect. But these land use regulations can be applied to any special use permit, subdivision, major or minor, or planned unit development for, I saw a lot, of, a lot of planners on this call, so I'll try to work through my acronyms, but um, most of you probably know what that is. So that can look like, you know, major planned unit developments, planned communities where we're diving into design guidelines, as well as, you know, doing this vegetation inventory so that we can have an accurate analysis of that wildfire hazard. And we put this on the applicant. We have some countywide mapping that we've done, but this is something that they would be submitting as part of their application. And they begin to identify, you know, what are they gonna grade over anyways for roads and, and, and infrastructure? Where's the water gonna be? That when you're looking at a big subdivision or PUD, that's probably inherent to the plan review process, but some of these special uses, for example, uh, you know, marijuana cultivation facilities, we've gone in and said, um, hey, we want that water for firefighting. Let's put some dry hydrants on there as well. Or, you know, we want to add different elements to say a small subdivision since we're increasing dead city in an area that might look like um, access provision for firefighters, which we're going to get into in a minute. We might want to know that we're locating building envelopes off of ridge lines and in gullies and, and chimney features and areas that are more conducive to extreme fire behavior. And then, you know, how how are we going to talk to you? How are you you're up there working on the hill and your your excavator scrapes a rock and starts a fire and you sever a line and make sure that we, you know, during the construction process, we have good dialogue capabilities. It is going to be responsible for doing all this. Next slide. So this is a this is one that I think becomes pretty contentious, and we just went through uh, a road variance process related to our dual access provision recently. And I see some familiar names on this in, in the participant list who's actually done this with me. But right, we have this issue with with one way and one way out communities back to the twenty percent of the county's private and it's mountainous. So you know it, the old development standard is to kind of push the road up the hill, subdivide, particularly if you're looking at 35 acre and larger lots that are um, exempt under the subdivision process in Colorado. How do we begin to account for, you know, development in the buoy beyond just seeing these building permits coming in the door and then 20 years down the road, oh, look at this neighborhood we created with 30 homes that go up a one way in and one way out road that's it's in and of itself a hazard. And what do we do now if we have a fire blocking that it, that point of the road and you know the fire department can't get in and the homeowners can't get out? So we require dual access for more than three dwelling units. And that is kind of, you know, that means six structures because we count the primary single family residence and an accessory dwelling unit as 
one dwelling unit per our land use reg. So you can have six structures on a road. And after that, it ceases to be a cul-de-sac and we need to have a dual access provision. So that's not always possible. There's a river or a mountain or a bunch of public lands or another community in the way. So, you know, it establishes this variant process, which is where we can go in and ask for, for things in lieu of secondary point of access, we can ask them to, you know, um, go in and, and adjust grades and site distances in which we can do roadside fuel reduction and fuel rate creation. We can add, um, you know, we can ask for a secondary access through an easement process with a neighboring property owner. We had one recently where they you could even get fire engines across this old bridge. So we got to resize the bridge. We got to put load ratings on it, signage, lighting, all kinds of things that um, might not be called out specifically in the land use regulations and site improvement standards or road improvement standards rather. So we have this process for a variance with the Board of County Commissioners and that we can kind of hash it out with the developer and the board. Here's what we need to, you know, make sure that we're adequately mitigating the hazard in this community without just sort of taking away property rights from, from folks or, or squashing development. So I think with any of this, having some kind of variance or process to get to a shared Alter, uh, alternative or, or, you know, is a good way to look at crafting your recs. Next slide. So now building permits are where it, you know, hits the ground more often than not. And we do a lot of these in the course of the year. And so um, we have, a, we do our building code by resolution. So we have a building resolution into the land use regulations that sort of spells out a hybrid code. So we haven't adopted necessarily a model code like the WUI code. And to previous questions, you know, we we're able to then go in and define existent resistant material, defensible space. So we can make all these definitions in our own resolution and then come back and, and define process later. And, you know, I can get to you what that looks like specifically if you're looking at a code rewrite or adoption. But like URA in Colorado Springs, we're kind of working with a, um, a self-developed home rule type code package that we're implementing. And I'll talk about how we go about that in a minute, but we're looking at all new construction, residential and commercial, and then exterior modifications, which include re-roofing and re-signing any kind of additions or modifications that includes the addition of a deck. So they're adding a new closet or, or kitchen fixtures. We don't get involved. They're, they're re-roofing or adding a deck or a, um, you know, five uh, more than 120 square feet, then that triggers the the regs. Which go ahead, next slide. Which are going to spell out a series of uh, you know construction requirements related to the roof, the deck, the eaves, the siding, the vents, and so on. Just like we've seen with other communities, as well as a defensible space review. And we would do this through site inspections, where staff will go out. Right? We start by looking at the structure or vacant lot and assigning it, uh, you know, a specific adjective hazard rating of low, moderate, high, or extreme, and and then we have some mapping and and site assessment criteria that we've used. It's kind of you know a pointed system that eventually gets us to calling some property low or high hazard, and that then dictates what those specific requirements are. And I won't go into all of those yet, but feel free to contact me if you want this document where we speak to what those requirements are, what are the testing standards, what are the, you know, we, we have a flame spread ratio is what we hang it on for, for um, decking materials or the classic ASTM E84, class A, class B, class C ratings for roofs. And we'll speak to what that is, what it means, go out there, look at the lot, each lot and give, you know, and then back it up with GIS mapping because in some situations, right, we might be costing people a whole lot of time and money to implement these regs, and we want to make sure that we, like we've heard from others, we've got the best science and expertise behind that. And we're not going to just go out and make them cut down a bunch of trees and brush and then landscape back in with all the juniper and wood mulch they can come up with. So we'll, we'll take a look at their landscape plan review and make those requirements as well. Next slide. <clears throat> and that all goes into this building permit process where I'm they submit for a building permit. It comes across uh, the desk of you know myself or my staff. We go out and we do a hazard rating 
either you know a field visit or if we know the area well enough, we can sometimes do that based on past knowledge and GIS. Assign that hazard rating and review the landscape and plans. Make sure that you know they they don't have a juniper hedge ringing the entirety of their wooden deck or something like that. Go out. Uh, we'll share this responsibility with our building department as far as reviewing for construction materials. I usually get our plans reviewer what the rating is, and then they can confirm whether or not it meets the class eight roof requirement or the siding is is up to stuff or the vents are appropriately screened and so on. And um, then they get their building permit. And prior to any other building inspections, which is usually footing and foundation, um, we go out and say, all right, you, once you've got the corners of this lot staked, we're gonna come out and talk about what trees need to go, what trees need to stay, give you a list of other particular uh, site-specific mitigation measures. All of that is, into this first wildfire inspection because you know it's particularly with the vacant lot it's easier to get those trees off prior to um, the house being in the way and then they're off and building over the course of time it takes to do whatever they're doing and we'll come back at the very end prior to their you know temporary or, or final certificate of occupancy and do a wildfire inspection to confirm the landscaping and the trees are trimmed and removed all, all of that happened according to plan next slide so, you know, how's it, how did this all get started with, like we said earlier, we had a bunch of uh, a big fire activity in Colorado and there was this need to do something, whether that's rush out with the garden hose, I think, and, you know, spray water on the bushes like this lady, that's largely what it felt like. And I think is probably where a lot of you are feeling like we've got this huge problem and how am I possibly going to impact it, especially if it's just me and I've got other jobs to do in my planning department or building department or so on. We kind of went through this coordination process like many of you are doing, and some of you have called me directly. We've already gone through this, and that's that's the way to go. Right? Learn from all friend, learn from the experiences of others. Don't feel the need to reinvent the wheel or implement stuff that maybe didn't work very well in other places. We adopted the regs and we hired a mitigation specialist. That there was, you know, somebody in this position before me, Ben Garrett, and then I took over. Uh, in 2006 and have been there since, but you can't expect the rules to enforce themselves. And this really is a full-time job. Um, I think I've, I've seen with other communities, it kind of gets handed off as collateral duty to a plan or a community development department or building official. And it, it takes a lot of attention. It takes some expertise and it takes some other things that you might tie it to. Like we talked about risk mapping. We haven't talked necessarily about um, alignment with the community wildfire protection plan. Maybe you already have something like that. Maybe you can help with the two talking to each other. That was our next step. Go on, next slide. Next slide. So how's it going? Well, we're up to a, a mighty two person department now, which took 15 years to get to, but so it still feels like now I'm, I'm charging out against this crowd, there's just two of us charging out and taking on a crown fire with the chainsaw. But, you know, we've added a bunch of other things after, again, ongoing demand for action following things like, uh, you know, all the fires we've seen over the last five years. But we've supplemented it with our, you know, a voluntary program, our real fire program, which we work closely with Boulder County Wildfire Partners to develop. And, and you know, just homes that are being built or under construction is just kind of scratching the surface as far as what's out there in the wooey. And then back to, you can't do it all by yourself, especially not with just two FTEs. So we've, you know, rebirthed our Eagle County Wildfire Council into the Wildfire Collaborative over the last year or so. And, and we're handling a lot of, we're parsing out things like fuel reduction work and, and outreach and other sort of code compliance with towns and development of uh, code updates through that group. We've got partnerships with um, a bunch of the fire districts through through a, part, a team known as Eva Valley Wildland. We were able to share that work and then we're able to bring it to the neighborhood level and kind of have those spark plugs, those neighborhood ambassadors in each community working to bring up people in the door helping them to understand those code requirements, what they're for, getting them signed up for voluntary assessments, cost share assistance, creating shipping programs and supplementing all that stuff. Because like we've heard, codes don't get you all the way there alone. Next slide. 
So what's that workload look like? You know, when I started, and I think this was true for my predecessor, we were largely building inspectors, almost exclusively. Limited, you know, we get some land use, land use review. We'd, we'd work with the planners to know what to do. And we're not, you know, most people coming into a job like mine aren't planners. Um, some may be, which is a good thing, but maybe you're not a firefighter. It's kind of this, how do we, how do we learn to make the two work? And it was really focused just on that regulatory aspect. And it went over about as you might expect with the public, you know, people throwing turns around like to come in and do you do this to me? This is a percent of burden. We'll give it all the other parties in my life. Like, you know, this might be in your community, might be recovering from a large fire, or like all communities dealing with labor shortages and inflation. Um, just one more thing, how dare you, and this is infringing on my property rights, and of course, no place for government to get in, involved, which is, <laughs> that last statement is not how they feel when the fire is coming, but it is often what you hear when you're talking about a code um, adoption. Go on, next slide. How are we doing? Uh, I, I think we got a long, long ways to go, but at least we've got a lot more in the suite of fire adapted ac actions that we could be taking in our community happening. We're actually doing way more real fire voluntary assessments than we are uh, building permits. Um, that number around, you know, 100 permits a year is that has been very steady, honestly. Um, it's a little bit bumped up over the last few years. Um, but that voluntary piece is more, more, there's more people out there that aren't even touching their home that want to know what to do than there are coming in for a permit. I would say that we've moved from that opposition phase into public acceptance. Um, in fact, so much so that we are currently through the wildfire collaborative working with a bunch of towns looking to adopt codes and are attempting to create some kind of unified code package so we don't end up with one code in unincorporated Eagle County, another one in, in one town, another one in another town, and so on. Um, but I think generally that development community understands this is the cost of building. They understand the purpose. They know why we're doing this. It's been around so long that they they accept it. They they real they know we can talk through the options. It's not just black and white. Um, you know, we have standards and, and requirements, but they're all subject to change. And then if, you know, you're unlucky, you're lucky, depending on a little of both, right? You have a fire. Uh, we have the Lake Christine fire, and you threaten a bunch of homes, burn down some homes, and, and potentially end up running fire into a lot of places where you've done mitigation work before. And then your community and your partners realize this, this works. Mitigation works. We've seen, we, we were able to save this home or structure a community, and then we share that out with the public and help to uh, justify our existence. That's what I've got. Um, I'll turn it back over to Molly and Becca, and then we'll get to the panel discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Eric. And so I just wanted to point you to a couple quick resources available through the Community Wildfire Planning Center's website. We actually just launched a new um, WUI planning hub. So you can scroll over your state. Not every state has resources related to the WUI, by the way, but WUI planning. Uh, but we're trying to populate it as resources become available. So for Colorado, you can access this report as well as many other state agency reports or other um, resources related specifically to land use planning and the wildland urban interface. Um, so I wanted to you know, direct your attention to that. And on the next slide, there's also a new tool we also launched, which is a, a land use planning evaluation tool. So it's really designed for fire officials or land use planners within a specific jurisdiction to fill this out. It's a very general assessment um, to help you get a sense of where you are in terms of or perhaps what you could be considering uh, for planning and regulating development in the WUI. So again, this is on the communitywildfire.org website under our new WUI planning hub. Um, it's called the Fire and Land Use Planning Evaluation Tool. And if you if this is helpful for your jurisdiction, it's really meant to be a tool for you. Um, we encourage you to check it out. Next slide. 
So I just want to thank Ashley and Ben and Eric again for their time, both in the time that they gave us when we were uh, researching and doing this report, as well as being willing to uh, be on this webinar today. I'm sorry those email addresses are a little faded, but I can pop them in the chat um, as we go through our conversation. So we left about 20, 20 minutes for questions and answers. Thanks, Becca, for sharing those emails. I have a few general questions for the panelists, and then we'll open it up to questions. I've captured questions that haven't been answered along the way, as well as any other questions that come in. Um, but first, I wanted to just get, have the benefit of asking Ashley and Ben and Eric a broad question that we observed when we were doing the research with you is that, you know, to some extent, you mentioned there were some fires in the area um, or fires on the, in the state that kind of precipitated or catalyzed your jurisdiction's interest in initially adopting regulations. But what also struck me is that you didn't wait for a devastating fire in your specific community to adopt those regulations. So I wondered if you could each speak to you know, what advice would you have for communities who are thinking about adopting wildfire regulations now? In other words, they don't want to wait, for, you know, they don't, they want to be proactive, but where would they start? And, you know, is sometimes we look at, is it better to be incremental in the approach or to think as comprehensively as possible to address the full uh, amount of risk that exists in the WUI? So maybe, um, Ashley, we could start with you and then Ben and Eric, your comments on that. Yeah, that's a good question, Molly. Um, I would say, you know, any advice for the communities is one to really, you know, here for Colorado Springs, we, um, you know, we work with 142 homeowners associations. Um, before Waldo Canyon, we only worked with 63, but I think um, really having the community buy-in for what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, I saw a question in the chat earlier about, you know, have the HOAs, you know, agreed or been on board, you know, with what the fire departments are doing. And I would, you know, for Colorado Springs, I can speak for that and say, yes. Um, they've been very supportive of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And after Waldo Canyon happened and we actually made um, all of our codes a little bit stricter, they were on board for that and they wanted that because um, there at some point will be another fire here in Colorado Springs. So doing everything that we can do. But I would just say um, really making sure, you know, the HOA is on the HOAs or your communities, whoever you're working with are on board and understanding what you're doing. Um, every meeting we had, we always had it with the community. So we could listen to their input, you know, their questions and their concerns and get those answered. Um, and then, yeah, I think that is all I had. I had something else I was going to say, but it just <laughs> slipped my mind. We can add it later. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll think of things as we go through. But in Eureka County, I think the 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 need was widely observed in the community, and the the process was supported. Um, whether it was perceptions of preserving property values, or um, at one point, I think the following the Waldo fire in Colorado Springs, there were a few insurance carriers that had dropped. Um, you know, the region, and you could not get an, a homeowner's insurance policy through your favorite insurance company. And I think that was something that the community had perceived. Um, so there, there was an observable need and the, the very observable forest health issues in Uray County at the time um, made that up, those observations much more tangible as well. And people wanted to um, move forward. I think the trick was to do something, to do update the code in a way that was not perceived as draconian as well. Um, we did go through an exercise of analyzing the incremental cost of a new structure that did not, where this code would not apply, and uh, the same structure where our code did apply. 
And we found, you know, a class A roof can be achieved through um, in the most affordable type of roofing, which is asphalt shingles. And so that, you know, we, we, we were very thoughtful. We didn't want to like make it impossible to build unless you were going to build a concrete bunker. We made it doable. Um, and I, I think that gained support. Um, and so, yeah, we had a couple of reasons for why now, um, why not later. So, yeah, you know, building on, on some of that, I, you can do all of this without a fire, but you shouldn't ever let a disaster like that go to waste. So, you know, jump on it when you have that kind of social license, but it doesn't get you all the way there. Um, we did not have that kind of alignment with things like covenants and, and design guidelines in neighborhoods, a lot of wood shake roofing. Um, so rather than just say, yeah, no, roof, wood shake roofs are gone, we hang it on that hazard rating. So we have the ability to, to dictate it. We can say, you know, it's by assembly. So you, you could do it if you really want to pay for it. We make things cost prohibitive sometimes to get to the, the bad option. The, um, we have some, we have that flip side too. We're, we're a resort community with a lot of gated neighborhoods and full time design review boards and things that are like, you know, counter regulatory groups looking at, you know, so they're pushing for more trees. And you had some neighborhoods that would fine you thousands and thousands of dollars if you didn't cut down those, if you cut down those trees without permission. So now we've worked in alignment with them. They can streamline that process if they're working with the fire district or me. You know, we we can come in and squash them because our we supersede as the government entity here working on public and life safety issues, whether or not they have, you know, 25 spruce trees on their property per the design review board's guidelines. But you know, eventually I got tired of being in front of design review boards and fighting with people about this. So you just kind of get to like, here's our intent, what's your intent? How how do we find the middle? And then things start sprouting up like, you know, there's by ordinance at, at some of the larger communities that have the staff and metro districts requirements to remove beetle kill trees or treat vacant lots or class A roofing ordinance, or you can kind of push some of this off to other quasi-governmental agencies that help and run with it to the question, is it better to go with a full code adoption right away? Probably, maybe. <laughs> It depends on your community and what you're seeing out there. So it's a, to the point that's been made by everybody, find that out before you do anything. But just going with an implement, a, a, a phased approach is what I'm trying to say there. Maybe it's a roof ordinance this year. Maybe it's a fuel free fire free five the next. Maybe it's a defensible space beyond that. And you can kind of stack these things up to lessen the blow, I think is the approach I've been um, offering. Thank you. And you both, or both, all three of you spoke to um, this a little bit with costs and administrative capacity, but we also hear this is typically a barrier that comes up for a lot of communities. And I think you sprinkled in some really helpful examples, but I wanted to just draw this question out a bit more. If you could speak to, again, any advice you have for communities struggling with this, we, they want to adopt regulations, they're interested in this, but they're really not sure how to go about um, taking this type of role on. So again, maybe this speaks more to an incremental approach, but do you have any advice or anything that you saw particularly that worked well in your communities to get the ball rolling and to overcome that perceived barrier or very real barrier of this will take time for someone to administer and we and it will also take expertise for someone to administer. I didn't speak to that, Molly. Um, we are, are really excellent West Region Wildfire Council has been operating in this space for um, in, in more extensively uh, and for a longer period of time than the county had, even though we had the 1999 regulations. The, what we found, and there's a lot of information on this, is this, the social science of giving a nudge. You know, one neighbor in a neighborhood does a, a good implementation that encourages maybe two or three other people 
to take actions to protect their property. And over time, if the nudge is kind of a, a positive, encouraging, um, you should do this because it will protect your neighbor. And that got, um, I think over time, the, the, the energy around the positive action built up. As far as um, building an administrative capacity, it was a burden to build this into our, um, our county's land use staff. It took a couple of months to, um, you know, from code adoption to code implementation to train the staff and make sure that the staff had enough time that it wasn't a burden on the number of applications they were processing. Um, it's, always, it's something to consider. You can't adopt a code without making sure that you can enforce it. But they're all big considerations. Eric or Ashley, did you have anything else you'd like to add to that? Just ditto. Yeah, yeah again, you, you, you don't have to take it on all by yourself, but somebody has, this needs to be like their job. I think when it's shared across multiple, even I was shared across building and planning when I first started, um, which isn't great either because then I have like three bosses, but it was a, me focused on this one problem and that needs to happen as well. And then to Ben's point, right, you, you probably have help out there if it's a wildfire council or a collaborative or the state forest service or the fire district or the uh, CDPHE or FACO or Ember Alliance or something. There's, you know, call your friends. That's that's the, the, the message I would say and, and find out who can help you with because you're going to bump up in a capacity or expertise issue almost right away. Yes, I echo what Ben and Eric said too, is there's no way that one person can do this. Um, I mean, to put it into perspective, we have five full-time staff um, and even right before Waldo Canyon fire, we did too. And all of us were doing, helping with the rewrites, um, doing the community meetings for, for all of this, um, and then going to you know city council to say, this is what we would like to do and move forward. Um, I would also say, just going back a little bit too, is, you know, trying to put everything into, you know, your first go around for a code um, might not necessarily be so good. You know, I think like Eric said, it's depending on your community. Um, here for Colorado Springs, you know, we had a little bit and then Waldo Canyon happened and we were able to add a little bit more. Um, there are more things I'm sure we could have added into our code, but we also know who the residents are and we didn't want to go in and basically, you know, tell them everything that they had to do on their property when they were building a house, because that's really not going to gain good compliance here in Colorado Springs. Um, so we didn't do that. But, you know, we also did have um, from 1993 to 2012 when Waldo Canyon happened, um, we already had these additional, you know, items in our code that we wanted to add kind of up on our shelf. Um, so Waldo Canyon happened in the end of June and, you know, by the end of the year, council had already approved our updates. So, you know, having something like that on the shelf where you can kind of work through it and just have it there, if something were to happen or an update that you want to go after, I think is also really beneficial too. Yeah. I thought that was a really key insight that we heard from you, Ashley, and Fire Marshal Lacey during our interview with Colorado Springs. So that's a fantastic tip. Let's be ready for that opportunity. Um, so I'll switch gears into the chat questions that haven't been answered yet. Thank you for everyone who has put out questions. And if you have any, still sneak them in right now. We can try and get to them. Um, question for you, Eric, is once a home is constructed and compliant, does the initial hazard rating change? And if so, what does that process include or look like? Yeah, good question. <clears throat> I guess it depends on, you know, we're looking largely at classic inputs for fire behavior, right, slope, aspect, vegetation type, um, those kind, of, you know, access. Some of those are sort of set, but then, you know, how the home was built, amount of defensible space that was created, 
that can definitely impact the overall hazard rating moving forward. But then, and so then it really only matters when there's a new building permit application. So that then you kind of get into the self judgment and how are you going to you know make sure you you can make these decisions and stick to them because now I lowered the hazard rating and they want to come back in and re-roof. Do I say, oh yeah, sure, pull off the asphalt shingle and go with a wood shake? You know, I think you you can you still want to. Some things need to stay. The hazard rating is hinged on the fact that that house has a class A roof on it. Does that make sense? So some of it's stuck because we didn't change the slope of the mountain. Others are, are impacted positively and um, and it could change, but we're not really sharing this information out with an insurer or a, or would be home buyer or an HOA or anything like this. So it's really just to how we're applying code. Hopefully that gets there for you, Ben. Thanks, Another question for any of you, have any of you seen compliance with codes and regulations over the course of a few years? If there are steps taken towards the mitigation every year, um, especially for those folks that might not get all of their mitigation costs covered with city or county grants or cost sharing. I personally have not seen this because it's a regulatory process, um, but Ben, I suppose in some ways the um, URA County process might speak to this with the defensible space. It's not I don't want to say it's staggered, but there was some creativity in when the D space could be approved, right? Yeah, in in that case, I mentioned it um, that the predominance of like a pinion juniper forest system where a lot of our development is occurring. Um, you can't do implementation during the period from May to October because if you cut down the pinion tree. The pinion ips beetles will aggregate and kill all the other pinion trees around, even if they're outside the D space. So we, we, um, yeah, we we made some adjustments, and they can initially it was they get a temporary certificate of occupancy, and then that didn't work because if it's a new home and there's a mortgage and a financing arrangement by the the homeowner. They can't have a temporary CO. They need a CO so they can pay. A, you know, they can shift into their next phase of financing. Um, so we took a 1% deposit of the, not the uh, building permit fee, but of the, or maybe it was the building permit fee. Anyway, something that was meaningful to the homeowner to actually go ahead and do the D space after they got their CO so that they could come back during the winter months and implement. Um, another program that we have had, and I would love to bring it back, um, modeled on Summit County's shipping program is a sort of a curbside shipping program where people can slowly over time do their own work um, in removing some vegetation, whether it's limbs or whole trees, and then on, on a scheduled basis, move that to their the end of their driveway or it's, we don't really have many curbs in Uray County, but it's a, a, a way of doing a pile shipping program on a community-wide basis. And I think that over time, that really got people involved in implementing things themselves, even where it is existing construction instead of where these all this regulation is addressing new construction. It is probably true that our, one of our largest our, our bigger concern might be um, how to get existing construction, old houses that were predominantly built in the 60s and 70s into um, something that could comply if it was built new. Um, and that's it, always been a question of how do we get people to mitigate their 50 year old house that has wood siding, maybe a metal roof, but a long, narrow driveway and on, on a steep slope and it's just slowly building awareness in the community of yes, it's possible to do something even slowly if I do it myself. Great. The thing I noticed when I read through, because I didn't know much, I knew a little about Colorado Springs and nothing about what you I was doing, but everybody's doing this regular, you know, carrot and stick approach. You gotta, you have both. You can't, the codes don't get you all the way there, nor do chipping and cost share assistance programs and home assessment programs alone. 
but the two of them together are, are accomplishing a lot more. And, you know, that that's that imp incremental approach. I don't know if I noted that, right? You're only, it's our code is only applicable to the scope of work. So they come in for a new deck, they don't have to get everything, the siding, the, the roof, the eaves, everything up to compliance. It's just what they're touching. So to Ben's point, and I'm sure Ashley's gonna make the same one, but that's your chance to then be like, hey, we need to talk about all this other stuff that's happening and here are some here are some ways to get there. But you gotta have the ways to get there that aren't the stick also. And Ashley, sort of tied into that, I'm gonna turn over the last question we have time for to you because I think this fits really well into some things we've talked about with Colorado Springs is what provisions might be in place for follow-up after the initial construction to ensure that the initial wildfire mitigation materials are maintained, especially in areas where there's homeowner owner turnover? Um, so do you wanna to speak to that piece a little bit? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's um, honestly something we're trying to get in place here. And so, you know, again, we only have, you know, five full-time staff and we don't have one person that is dedicated to go out and do, you know, enforcement or inspections here. So once construction services signs off and gives that homeowner, you know, their occupancy, um, that's normally where we find out homeowners go ahead and they plant those, you know, conifers or junipers, you know, right up against their house. Um, so we are trying a few different things for 2023 right now. Um, what we're trying to do is an education program for the landscapers. And so they know what they can and can't be planting, you know, within the wildland urban interface on the new homes. Um, and then we're also going to be sending out either a packet of information or a postcard to new homeowners in our wildland urban interface. So we're gonna be getting that list from our county assessor site. So we can try to reach them that way. Um, we also have, for each of our neighborhoods, we have a neighborhood champion. And so we give them our um, information booklets and then they can go out and also hand those out to new homeowners. A lot of what we find out is homeowners one, they have no idea where they moved or they have no idea that they built in a wildland urban interface. So trying to educate them on that and just let them know that, you know, these are the codes that you have to follow for vegetation. So um, that is kind of um, what we are doing here. It's, you know, we've got to test some things out. Um, my ultimate goal would be to have um, one person dedicated to just the enforcement and the education here in the wildland urban interface to let homeowners know, um, you know, if their property is not in compliance. So, and then, I mean, just to say real quick, you know, off of what I think Ben and Eric said is um, you do have to build that awareness in the community and um, don't stop, you know, educating or doing what you're doing. So it's taken us um, you know what, 22 years to get where we're at. And we've had neighborhood meetings where nobody showed up or one person has showed up. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. So it takes time. Um, but, you know, don't give up and, you know, just keep educating and keep pushing. That is a good note to end on. Uh, don't give up and start today so you can be prepared for tomorrow, right? I think as we wrap up and say thank you, Becca, you had one final um, request for the speaker, or for not the speakers, the um, panelists to fill out a uh, follow-up survey. Is that correct, Becca? Or will you send that oh. out? Yeah, I just uh, dropped a link in the chat for you, you as participants to fill out a quick evaluation, if you would, for us, that so we can keep improving these over time. And um, I know Molly and I are committed to getting out a recording of this as long as well as a PDF of the slides that were shared today to all of you. Um, so we will do that and we can probably follow up as well with a few of the questions were in the chat that we didn't get to. And Becca, it looks like that link might need to be changed for the per permissions. So we'll follow up with that to make sure you can all actually access the 
post webinar survey. And again, if you're a planner, please check back in two weeks on APA's website to log these. I'm following up again with APA, but this has been approved for 1.5 CMs, so I want to make sure it gets listed. Again, huge thank you to Ben, Eric, and Ashley um, for your expertise and to FACO for co-hosting this today. We appreciate all of your attention and we look forward to seeing you in the WUI again soon. Thank you. And if people are still in, I did just change the link. Thanks, Becca. Thanks, Molly. Yeah, nice. Very well done.